Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for being here. My name is John Satterfield, and I am the captain of the Sheriff's Information Bureau. And uh, thank you for joining us today to uh, hear the sheriff discuss his uh, thoughts on the recent RAND report and uh, some of the organizational reforms that uh, he has made. And uh, I'd like to introduce Sheriff of Los Angeles County, Alex Villanueva. Good morning, everyone. We're here today to talk about the RAND report, and uh, I've had a chance to digest it. And uh, I read all 188 pages of it, cover to cover. And I do have uh, some good news and not some not so good news. But let's go into the nitty gritty of this thing. And uh, the good news is that Unbeknownst to the people who commissioned for this report to be done, the RAND report identifies what we could count as 37 recommendations. And our department on our own, without any knowledge of what they were doing or of their product, we've been, since I've taken office, we've been embarking on a campaign to reform, rebuild, and restore the department. We've done exactly that. And our reform efforts actually cover 30 of the 37 topics that the RAND report is asking that we, oop, okay back there? All right. So 30 of the, of the 37, and they're very long and lengthy, won't go into detail on those, are being covered. The seven that are not, we're assessing them to see if they're feasible, they're valid, applicable to the apartment, but some of them come with a funding issue. As a matter of fact, there's always a question about training. Well, to train our entire department for one day, one eight-hour training day, that's a price tag, $7.2 million. So when you're defunding the department, then the demanding that it be trained, well, you're really making life difficult. It's not going to be an easy thing to accomplish. So let's keep that in mind. All right. Of course, anytime you're trying to uh, change an organization, the culture of our organization or, or uh, implement significant reforms, it takes time, especially when you have an organization as large as the Sheriff's Department. We're the largest Sheriff's Department in the nation, probably the most complex operation, the second largest law enforcement agency by number of employees, and it doesn't turn overnight. It doesn't turn on a dime. It's like a, a very large battleship. It takes time for it to move, and moving it is. I promise you that. And we've also identified in the RAND report, they talk about a failures of past leadership. They don't really get into the details about the failures, they're just the shortcomings. And the fact is, we've been dealing with this issue about uh, subgroups and cliques for a long, long time. And every single one of my predecessors has kicked the can down the road, said it either didn't exist or did nothing, really, about it. But some people, particularly politicians across the street, are saying, well, 50 years, by golly, it's on your dime, you're going to have to fix it or else. So I think it's unrealistic and a political opportunism on steroids. So now we have initiated a lot of reforms. Let's talk about some of the important ones. And I won't even mention the big ticket item, for example, of uh, removing ICE from the county jails, a moratorium on transfers of inmates to ICE. Those are big items that are not related to this. So let's, let's focus on this. Deputy clicks policy. This is a policy that was never, ever written before. It conforms and is constitutionally sound and permissible, and it's enforceable, and it is currently being enforced. We cannot retroactively enforce it from past issues, but we are from this point forward. This was February of 2020. It rose public trust. We already know that. And engaging misconduct of any kind will be subject to discipline. This is a very important thing, because I know county council issued a very laughable opinion, and that was, again, uh, as dictated by the Board of Supervisors of County Council, and they're claiming that we can just ban groups outright. Well, that is not constitutionally permissible, and there's a difference. If a subgroup of any set of employees engages in misconduct, that is when I, as an employer, can intervene rightfully, and then we can uh, affect employment change and hold people accountable. A prime example of that happened, if you recall, in the years of uh, when Sheriff Baca was in office, there was a group called the Jump Out Boys. There was a lot of noise made, a lot of hoopla, and they terminated seven employees. 
But what they haven't been telling you, and the board will not admit this, that six of the seven have gotten their jobs back. And the last two were on my watch. They got their job back through the Civil Service Commission and through their own suits. And what was the reason why? Because there was no connection between their membership and misconduct. I ended up paying one employee nine years of back pay. That was over a million dollar settlement. Nine years. And that's nine years that that person was not serving the community. They were sitting at home. So the county, the, the public had to pay twice for the lack of someone working that job and then the fact we had to pay them for the job that he did not do because he was unlawfully terminated. That is a grim reality. Okay, let's go on here. We got uh, duty to intervene. I know this came uh, from the George Floyd uh, murder and something was glaringly. We had more or less the idea in our policies, but it was very vague and subject to interpretation from uh, share administration to administration. But we're leaving no doubt whatsoever. You shall intervene. And you have to report it. Not only do you have to intervene if something's going bad or criminally wrong, you have to report it as well. And if you don't report it, well, then you're subject to discipline yourself. This is very straightforward, and it leaves no doubt. Whistleblower protection policy. This did not, did not exist be before. So people who believe they've seen something wrong, they have an obligation to inform the employer. That is the essence of a whistleblower. If you do not inform the employer, you can't make file a lawsuit four years later and claiming all these outrageous things, but you never told the employer. And I've seen videos, I think it was CBS, with someone in disguise claiming that they saw deputies doing these outrageous illegal acts. Well, they were actually co-conspirators, accessories to crimes that they never reported to their employer. So how on earth is the employer going to address it? If any employee witnesses misconduct, they have an obligation to step forward and tell their supervisor. Stop the misconduct, of course, assuming it's safe to do so, and they have to notify a supervisor. That is the obligation of every single employee of this department, and we will hold everyone accountable to that. And for those who uh, see this one here, protects against retaliation, I myself when I was a young sergeant, I was fighting the corruption of the Lee Bach and Paul Tanaka regime back in the early 2000s. The Board of Supervisors, they looked the other way, didn't do anything about it, and I wish these type of policies were in play back in those days, but they weren't. So we were left to defend our, fend for ourselves. So we had this in play now. And this one, you heard a lot about this. I know it's kind of a... Uh, Difficult to understand the title on it, but actually what this means is we're conforming to SB 1421, which means we're releasing the names of deputies and deputy-involved shootings after a 30-day period where we've assessed for any potential threat. And we released a whole batch, I believe 95 of them recently, and one we withheld because there was an active threat that was uh, quantifiable. And that is just, this is common sense stuff right here. Okay. Now... We put a lot of, we put everything of the department onto the website. And this is our website, lsd.org. That's part of my uh, transparency promise. I campaigned on this. I delivered on this. Everything that is legally permissible, we're putting it on the website. And if you compare from previous administration, the website was nothing more than a yellow page with a couple of ads and a couple of links. Now it's an active website that's constantly being updated, refreshed with new information. Okay, so this is very good. Body-worn cameras, ultimate in transparency and, and a, a tool to hold people accountable. It is up and running now. We're at the 20th station being trained on it. By the end of, uh, actually by the next two months, we'll have all 23 stations with the body-worn cameras. This is accountability. This is transparency. We're actually doing it. And it would help if the people across the street acknowledge that. But the game plan for them is to keep repeating the same thing over and over again and never admitting that we actually are making progress. We are reforming. Speaking of accountability, since I've taken office, that's all the reportable contacts we've made. Almost five million. We've arrested about a quarter of a million during that same time frame. 
10,000 uses of force. The overwhelming majority of them are minor uses of force. Resisted handcuffing, takedown, use of pepper spray, for example. When you compare that to a quarter of a million arrests, 10,000 uses of force, that means we're actually very judicious when we actually do use force. And that's a good thing. If you look at the complaints versus commendations, okay, we're documenting those as well. Again, this goes to transparency and accountability. Discipline. I'm hearing again and again, and we're going to go into uh, uh, Chairwoman Solis' comments regarding the RAND report. She says we're not holding people accountable. Well, this is not something I want to brag about, but these are the hard, cold facts. We got this number hot off the press. 874 people disciplined, and I've signed 120 letters of intent to discharge. 120. And these are the range of, of things we're talking about. Alcohol, false statement, misconduct, domestic violence, excessive force. Everything that shameless politicians say we don't hold people accountable for, we are. One caveat in the thing that people should recognize that I don't prosecute. That is a job of the district attorney whose offices sit above me. They're responsible for the prosecution. I can do the criminal investigation, which we're doing. We turn it over to the DA and then nothing happens for years. We have cases that are four years old, deputy-involved shootings. We have no answer from the district attorney. I have sheets and sheets of cases where we've turned it over. They've been sitting it on for years, and we get no reply. And as the saying goes, justice delayed is justice denied. We need to know an answer. If a deputy-involved shooting was justifiable, it was a justifiable homicide or not. And if it is not justifiable, is there criminal conduct that is going to be prosecuted, yes or no? We need to know the answer of these things. The families of potential victims need to know this as well. The deputies whose lives can be on hold for years and years need to know this as well. And the fact that it takes years for a decision from the DA's office is unacceptable. Their standard should be 90 days. We should have an idea one way or another. So we can move on in either direction depending what the facts of the case are. Okay, now, so the, the RANT report actually affirmed and supports what we're doing, which is pretty cool. They didn't expect that, but especially because they're doing their thing, we're doing our own thing, and it looks like we brought the two together. Hey, the sad thing, though, is the RAND report, the authors never came back to myself, my executive staff, and said, hey, these are our findings. What are you doing regarding these findings? Because they could have reported this in their report. All the things that are going on that conform or, or confirm what their observation, their recommendations are. That would inform the public. It would have been very useful. For some reason, they decided not to do that. They should have reconciled it, and they opted not to. Why? Well, that's on them. But here's a troubling statement from there. Community leaders and members were mostly critical of current department leadership. You know, I read through the entire report, and I did not find a single reference comparing current department leadership and past department leadership. Not one. So how? Did they come up with that? I also found out in their methodology that they had the Civilian Oversight Commission, appointed by the Board of Supervisors, provide people who were then subject or participated in the focus groups and the process of gathering information. Well, that's kind of comical in a sense because it taints the entire product, if that's who you're drawing it from. If they drew randomly from the public at large is one thing, but if they're drawing it from people who already have a huge bias against the department, well, that skews their results. But even with all that, I still don't find anything that supports that. So why was that inserted in there? Maybe the RAND people can uh, address that question. Here's another one, and this is the most important one of all. I got two statements from the same report. One says there are still actively adding members. Another one says, do not seem to be actively adding members. They can't seem to make up their mind. Now, this is where the news media, the print media, I should add, took off on this part here. Oh, boy, did they take off. In fact, let me give you some choice uh, titles alone. Don't you have to go to the article. Deputy clicks in L.A. County Sheriff's Department likely growing study fines. This is the L.A. Times. And they got it based on that sentence. Now, 
Where did that sentence come from? Well, they interviewed 1,608 deputies, or deputies who responded, I, I should say. And of those 1,608, they did not ask if they were a member or not. They were only asked if you were invited to join. Because they said they had an issue with that in participation, which is fine. But then they asked them in five-year increments within the last five years, the last 10 years or whatnot else. So of all the 1,608, 16%, 257 deputies were asked to join. Total. Okay. 16% out of the 1,608 sworn who responded, okay? That's a small number, but then that 16%, we dig deeper, what about within the last five years? Now that number drops to 64, which is only 4%. And then it's last five years. Well, something happened within the last five years. It was from the McDowell administration to my administration. They made no effort to distinguish between administrations. That would have been very informative to the public and to the department and myself. And then they don't ask the question, well, did they actually join or not? So that 4%, we don't know which side of the administration occurred on. For argument's sake, let's split it in half. Now we're down to 2%. And of that 2%, did they don't join, yes or no? We don't know. Now all of a sudden you see... Can you sustain the LA Times title that says it's likely growing? Of course not. Why? Because now, with all the negative press associated with the deputy subgroups, with the efforts that, that I've done, my administration has done, putting the policy, enforcing the policy, creating a video that every single member of the department had to see, they had to sign an attestation form, and it goes into each individual's personnel jacket. None of this was mentioned in the RAND study. Why? Because they were not interested in the truth. That's the sad reality. And these are facts. Had they come back to us to reconcile the recommendations with our efforts, we'd have told them all this. And they should have reported it, but they didn't. Look what Rolling Stone said. Executioners, reapers, and banditos, gangs of sheriff's deputies are wrecking havoc in L.A. Wow. They got that out of that. And we picked that apart. So Rolling Stones, uh, wow. Here's another one, LA Sentinel. Report reveals that Los Angeles Sheriff's Department rife with gangs and cliques. Oh boy, okay. Spectrum One News, Witness LA, every single one ran with this thing in one way or another suggesting that it's a huge problem. You know what it is? It's a problem of perception, but not reality. And that is a hard, cold fact about this issue. And that's why you'll see, let's move on. But the hard, cold facts are subgroups exist in every large organization, particularly paramilitary organizations, be it the U.S. military, be it in firefighting organizations, fire departments, police departments, if you're large and there are multiple subunits, invariably you're going to have subgroups in them. The question is if that subgroup deviates into some type of misconduct that harms. That is the key point here. Because they did not go into detail on all the subgroups within the department that nothing happens. They're a glorified bunch of people that go to the river and party on the weekend, and that's about it. That's all they are. Now, let's go a little bit further here. Hilda Solis, this is her statement from the RAND report. And I'm troubled by the fact that she's troubled. RAND Institute study supports a decades-long troubling history of deputy gangs in L.A. County Sheriff's Department. It does not support it. She bought for a study, she got her study, and she's using that as a launching pad to continue her campaign and that of the Board of Supervisors to discredit, defund, and delegitimize the Sheriff's Department for their political gain at the expense of public safety. That is shameful. Now, unfortunately, due to LSD leadership's inability and frankly unwillingness to consistently hold deputies and the respective supervisors accountable, Really, 
And what does she base that on? Apparently, she just made it up. And that's the sad thing. We need to hold our elected officials accountable. Yes, elected officials. Just like we hold our deputies accountable for the tough job they do, we need to hold our elected officials accountable as well. Now she talks about the sheer amount of money that has come out of hardworking taxpayer wallets to page large settlement, almost $55 million. Well, we looked into that $55 million. It turns out there were settlements going back to 1990, and their search criteria was if the word deputy gang, deputy click, subgroup was anywhere in the accusation or the complaint or a deposition. Not a single penny arose from a trial and something that was proven at trial. Not one penny. But it's a good number to trot around, 55 million. Well, I got another number to trot around for Supervisor Hilda Solis. They spent $80 million in one day to cancel the Mental Health Treatment Center that should have been built to treat the mentally ill they are wandering around dying in the streets right now. That is a waste of taxpayers' money. And the fact that hardworking taxpayer wallets and precious dollars, well, I need, she needs to look at herself she spent 80 million bucks in one day and she did not bat an eye when she did it. Shame on her. They spent 6.5 billion dollars over just 10 years on homelessness only to see the problem multiply. She spent 57 million dollars on a Hilda Solis Care First Village right on the shadows of Men's Central Jail that sits largely empty while Olvera Street is surrounded by pop-up tents with the homeless. And she's worried about spending hard-earned hard taxpayer dollars? Mm. Her priorities are very strange. Okay. Now, this is where it gets really weird. She's neither surprised nor shocked. Well, then again, she actually admits a freezing of department funds. She actually froze department funds, deprived the community of the deputies necessary to keep the community safe in the middle of a crime spree where we have people stealing left and right, homicides spiking through the roof, 63% at last count. And you want to somehow teach us a lesson by freezing our funds? That's not going to make anyone any safer. I got to solve rate of homicides is down to 35% and dropping because we don't have enough investigators. I have 0 0.9 deputies per 1,000 residents. That is the lowest level in the entire nation in the most populous county in the entire nation. Let that sink in. The lowest staffing level in the entire nation in the most populous county in the entire nation. And she brags about freezing department funds as somehow a way to curb a perception that is apparently not grounded in reality. Shame on you, Supervisor Hilda Solis. Supporting legislation. Well, I didn't support legislation. I actually sponsored AB 958. AB 958 was modeled after the Sheriff's Department deputy click policy. They intervened to try to change the language because they were trying to get the Inspector General to have the same authority as the Attorney General of California. They tried to slide that in. She doesn't talk about that. Fortunately, that did not happen. The legislation altered slightly, but we sponsored it, we supported it, and it should be signed into law by the governor. Again, this is about perception. Perceptions can be manipulated. Perceptions can be harmful, either right or wrong, because people deal and believe in perception. Anything you can feed into a cell phone and look at it, because a community, all they're going to look at is the headline. They're not going to go into the details. And that is what the politicians across the street are counting on. And that's how they're spending our taxpayer dollars to discredit, defund, and ultimately destroy public safety, the Sheriff's Department, for their narrow political gain. This ring a bell? That's a real gang member trying to kill two deputy sheriffs. That is the grim reality of an underfunded, understaffed law enforcement agency working in incredibly bad conditions. If Supervisor Solis took the time to read through the report, she would read sections that say that understaffing and limited deputies means that they're facing very adverse conditions out there in the community. They have to rely on each other. And there's a sense of sol solidarity, camaraderie that comes with working literally in the trenches in life and death circumstances. 
and not going to begrudge anybody who's going to celebrate that with a beer or, or enjoy their company on the weekend. It's when they go into misconduct that we draw the line. And that's what we are doing. That's what we have done. And we're doing the first effort from this department to separate fact from fiction. Okay? But remember that image. Keep that in your mind. That is a grim reality of today. Those are real gangs, and you have the make-believe gangs that the Board of Supervisors is trying to sell you. Now, so I'm going to leave it at that. Now, these are the five individuals responsible for that. And I'm going to separate two. These two here at the bottom are engageable. They are reasonable. These three right here, they're responsible for the policy of defunding the Sheriff's Department. They're the one that dictate to the CEO, yeah, let's keep removing funds from the Sheriff's Department while they're sitting on a $2 billion budget surplus. Can't be explained. So anyway, I'm going to leave it at that. Any questions? Far away. Ooh, we could find that answer, but it's going to take a little while to okay. dig through it. That's fine. That can be done. One, the statements that you made where you said that um, they were making their assumptions based on those two statements that were um, similar in nature, could you give us some context? There were, you know, the, the ellipses that were before that. Could you give us context on what, yeah, go back right there. Mm -hmm. What was the context leading up to those statements? And were the, was the context the same in both cases? Well, the, here's, here's something that, the RAM report tries to understand it, but they don't quite really grasp it. Grasp it. Subgroups exist, but they're a f there's a dynamic situation. It moves on in time. For example, when I was working patrol in East LA, oh, Sorry. oh, I should be all right. When I was working patrol in East LA, there was a group called the Cavemen. I worked side by side with them. I was not invited. Did not get the tattoo. There was no difference between what I did, what they did. There was really great cops out there, outstanding. There were some lazy ones who had everything in between, the whole gamut. That group moved on with their careers. They moved on. They're now at the age of their retiring. They don't exist anymore. Same thing with the other group, the Vikings. They moved on. And the question is, when you can't connect the dots, it's, it's not what they're trying to sell it to be. For example, if I detain a carload of four people that just pulled a bank robbery and they're four gang members, I look at the career history of the four gang members and they're all going to have multiple arrests, multiple convictions, they'll be tatted down, they'll have guns. They're engaged in crime. That is their entire purpose. Penal Code Section 186.22 defines what that gang is. They're trying to use that a pejorative term against the Sheriff's Department and against law enforcement for their own very, uh, their ulterior motives, but it doesn't hold up to, to stark reality. If we go back to the picture of the two deputies, do they look like gang members to you? I go to their, I go to their record. Let's just compare the two. This is what a gang member does. This is what a deputy sheriff does. If any does not understand the difference between the two, well, you should have your eyes examined. Good question. There have been uh, the Colts Commission report, I think it had a chapter kind of devoted to it, which was a somewhat decent effort at the time. And, uh, but they, their focus was on a lot of topics, and I think that was just one. This is probably the first one that was devoted entirely to this. Uh, Sean Kennedy from the Oversight Commission did his cheesy report with the Loyola Marymount, and that's an embarrassment that they actually put their name to it. So I don't want to even count that one. But price tag, this is actually, there's two costs to this. The actual real cost is over a million dollars for the, the effort itself. But they also, there was a $1.5 million in property tax forgiveness that the county bequeathed to the Santa Monica based Rand Institute. That is a subject of a, actually of a lawsuit and a whistleblower complaint from within the assessor's office. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is something that should have been 
put in the rent study, the cost, and they also that tax forgiveness of a million and a half, because that goes to uh, credibility. Thanks, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can we go back to the slide with the number of the letters and the tax? Uh -huh. Two questions on those and then another one. Okay, the, the first number, the number of personnel discipline, that's an actual number, correct? Yes. Of those, the overwhelming majority are gone. Remember, because you have to do the investigation. There has to be a, um, a critical incident review or case review where the executives recommend the discipline then is signed off. And I'm the last person who signs off on the discipline. Then from there goes to a Skelly hearing, typically within 10 days. And after that, then the discipline is imposed. So it's a process, but the 120 probably 116 of them have already gone through that, and just the last few have not got to that stage yet. And how many have gotten their jobs back? That I know of, only nine. Um, and sort of on this topic, um, the, there was a report with the Sacramento Bee who went through your Wikipedia page, and it looks like a lot of changes have been made. Did you order that? Did, did um, anybody in the department do that? Did your re-election campaign handle that? There's been a battle between diff two different groups. One are supporters and one are, uh, I guess, trolls that are really trying to jack up the Wikipedia page because they have the physical ability to edit it. And that's what you're seeing. It's, it doesn't sound like a troll the way it's written. It's written as if it sounds like someone who is a supporter. A supporter, I'm pretty sure a supporter of the department did actually put the framework of it, which is, I think it happens in every, every public figure. Did you, but I'm gonna, I guess my question is, did you, did you instruct anyone? No. No, they're doing that on their own, and God bless them. Can you address the subpoena issue tomorrow with the Civilian Oversight mm -hmm. Commission saying that you wrote this letter saying you're too busy? Do you believe the subpoena requires you to appear? I'm glad you asked that question, actually. You have the Board of Supervisors. This Board of Supervisors appoints all nine members of the Oversight Commission. All nine. That is not a deliberative body. It's a kangaroo court. Their entire role is to discredit the Sheriff's Department, every single thing they do. If you compare the Oversight Commission pre my administration and mine, it's like they just shifted gears, just like the Inspector General, exact same thing. These are all the pol political appointees of the Board of Supervisors. They're acting at their behest. They're conducting a proxy war to discredit my administration. Everything they do with subpoena is exactly for that purpose. They're not getting anything new. Everything I provided you today, we've provided this to the Oversight Commission, but they will never get enough because their role is to discredit, not to seek information. Remember, have they ever subpoenaed our department for any record of anything? Until last week, they hadn't done any. Literally, entire year, the first thing they went after was the subpoena of the sheriff. And now I have the... Uh, the, the chair of the Oversight Commission says that, well, the sheriff has to drop whatever he do and he has to come to talk to us. I'm like, how about we arrange this? I think we're going to meet again with the Oversight Commission. Last time I met, they were, I'm not sure they even know what they're doing very well. They were rude, unprofessional, disruptive, and I couldn't even speak. It was like it was an inquisition. So not very productive use of anyone's time. So to follow up on my colleague's question. Yes. Mm -hmm. and answering a question directly, so why not do that? Well, the, the question is, I have people that can answer questions directly on all the data. But, for example, the governor of the state of California was sued recently, and he fought the subpoena because he was subpoenaed. And if you go to the Code of Civil Procedure, you start out at the lowest level that can provide you the information. They're skipping all the levers that can answer all of their questions and going straight to the top because their goal is not to seek information or to clarify anything. Their goal is to discredit and disparage the office of sheriff. That is their goal. Understand that. If this was a truly deliberative body, I would appoint four members of the Oversight Commission, and I'd probably appoint at least a few Latinos. So this non-Latino board, all appointed by the board, it, it loses it. If you look at all the boards that the, count, the city has, for example, there's some boards that has an appointee from the mayor, from the chair of the 
our council president, the council members, same thing with state government. You have a bunch of different people from different political interests making appointments to these bodies. and You get more or less a deliberative body because you have conflicting points of view. There are no conflicting points of view with this crowd. They have only one mission, which is to discredit me. And they're using the subpoena as a tool to do exactly that. And you're buying it hook, line, and sinker. Well, forgive me, but what, what is on your site? That, that I can share that you with Tony Blanchard, our, our aide. He has the information for you. Sure, we'll provide it after tomorrow. We're not going to, for security reasons, give up the sheriff's schedule in advance. But what we can, I can tell you this. I will meet with the, with the Oversight Commission. And in fact, we're going to arrange a meeting, I think, in the next two months. And I have no problem sitting down with them. All right, we can do that. But I don't work for them. I work for the people. I have some you, you paint a picture of, as, of the board coming after you. Why is that? Why, why do you think they're out to get you? One simple reason. They have never accepted the results of the election of 2018. They endorsed the other side. And the other side gave them exactly what they wanted, absolute control over the sheriff's department. I'm, my boss is the people of Los Angeles County, not the Board of Supervisors. And that is something they cannot stomach. And they're actively working. In fact, I had my, uh, in fact, uh, uh, one of my aides that works with the Board of Supervisors, I had him, hey, look through all the motions that the board has authored regarding the Sheriff's Department. It was such a telling tale. Four years of the McDowell administration, they authored nine negative motions. My administration to date, they're up to, I think, 45. Is that the right number? 67. 67. Now, you tell me, what are they doing with 67 and under McDonald it was 9? There's a reason behind everything they're doing. They're playing a political game, and you folks are chasing checkers while they're playing chess. And I think everyone needs to start realizing it's a political machine, and they, do, they want absolute control over county government, but they don't want the responsibility of what happens when things go bad. That's the whole game. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you talked about accountability with personnel being disciplined, but some of us have had issues trying to get information from the department accordance to 1421. That says that we should have access to information if someone is involved in a use of force incident. And I asked specifically about a deputy's reports who was placed on administrative leave for a use of force allegation in mm -hmm. falsifying false reports. Okay. He was later involved in a deputy involved shooting, but when I asked for those 1421s, I was told that releasing their name would reveal their identity and endanger their safety. When was that? This was, uh, it's dated June 24th, and we still haven't gotten that. Anymore. June 24th of this year? Yes. When did it release all the data on the, on the uh, 998s? Come talk to me afterwards, and we'll find out more about that. Okay. It might already been released, but your request and what we released. Remember I said we released 95? That might be part of that. The, the RAM report deals with allegations of assaults by deputies against other deputies. Mm -hmm. How many of those 120 uh, have you been able to discipline for alleged actions against that they've taken against other deputies? I know at least, at least five for sure. Well, for example, I can tell you of four that's already public, and we've talked about it. That was the Kennedy Hall incident. There was four individuals who were terminated, and the Board of Supervisors cannot admit that. Neither can the Inspector General, Max Gustav Huntsman. He spent all this time decrying the quality of the criminal investigation, yet he couldn't stomach the fact that those four uh, were terminated and... They were the defendants in the lawsuit from the deputies, and they still can't stomach that either because we held them accountable. It doesn't fit the narrative. Remember, there's a false narrative they keep pushing, and you keep seeing the same words, accountability, transparency, oh my God, oh my God. Yet when we actually hold people accountable and transparent, they just go radio silent. They don't want to talk about it. And we just got to start paying attention to the language they use and how it's being manipulated. Sir. Well, it's real simple. One is uh, by complaint. That incident that happened, the Kennedy Hall incident, that drew quite a few complaints that very, that very night or the, the day after. And 
the previous administration did the right thing. They initiated both a criminal investigation and then here's the part that's uh, difficult for us and this uh, is called the Gates-Johnson Agreement and that means that we have to do the entire criminal investigation, have a decision from the district attorney before we can start an administrative investigation, which means when it comes to accountability, it could be on hold for a really long time. And I'll give you an example. We had one recently where the DA finally came back and said, oh, there's no crime. All the parties had retired already. That's how insane the system is right now. And this is a, a decision that dates back to 1990. It's 31 years old. So we're working with the unions, and we've already informed that we're going to start moving past that now to become more... Uh, responsive and current so our decisions are closer to the event and not years down the road and that is just it's an anchor we've been swimming with for a long long time yes are you worried that so the ram report went into the fact that a lot of your deputies don't feel comfortable coming forward reporting these instances of harassment and assault by other deputies are you worried about that that like within your department there's people who don't feel like they can come forward well, there's going to be a small group that doesn't feel in any organization. I don't think, because one thing is, that, for example, any organizational setting where you're going to go to a supervisor to complain about another employee is fraught with the concerns because your, your working environment, you're going to create distrust, animosity. It's in true in any, any profession, any organization. And our Whistleblower Protection Act and the Whistleblower Act itself, we're we're going to definitely defend people and we're a large enough organization we can accommodate transferring people who want to work in a different environment away from the problem we can do that but ultimately we have to protect the people who come forward to complain about it we have an obligation as an employer to react to information actionable knowledge but we can't be held accountable for what we do not know and that's the bottom line Well, this is improving the process because these are th brand new things that no other sheriff has ever done. In fact, all of this is stuff that no other sheriff has ever done. So we're improving a lot of process and we're making it user friendly. We're, uh, we're trying to lower the temperature within the organization. And in some places it uh, runs hotter or colder than other places because of what's going on on the ground. Because we're a very large organization, but we're also about 67 different units that work in all different areas in different set of circumstances. Sure. Sir. That's the idea of accountability and discipline. You've got 874 you know, cases there, 120, which you said, I think 116 have already been adjudicated, and the vast majority of those people are gone. Have any of the others, the, I don't know, 750, I think, you have left, have they objected to the disciplinary action? Has that gone through? Has the or not? Well, now... If you go for the how long it takes to take a case, for example, say if I give someone a 20-day uh, suspension, they're going to appeal it. They go to the Skelly hearing. The Skelly hearing, the uh, hearing office says no, it's sustained, and then the discipline is imposed. Then they appeal to the Civil Service Commission. As soon as they do that, that adds a year to it right there. So just say the very first day I took office, December 3rd of 2018, uh, someone got handed a 20-day uh, discipline and it, it was a scale hearing happened to be that day they appeal it now we're on December of 2019 and then they get a hearing officer then they're going to a hearing which might take another six months you can see how now you're into 2020 and you still haven't heard that and that's something that happened in 2018 so the lag time in all these is is horrendous and what happened in previous administration, in fact, the previous administration, they flooded the system so greatly with cases at the civil service level, at internal affairs level, that we were losing cases on statute of limitation because they did not have enough time to investigate the cases. And it was unnecessary. Is there anything your office can do to try to remove that lag or make suggestions for changes in civil code procedure to speed up this process? I mean, a lot of us know that in some cases, legal procedures are like a constipated elephant. It takes months for anything to happen. Well, There's a pile of dung nobody wants to get near. Is it going to be, are you just suggesting, you know, you've got these boards, they needed to be sped up? Well, one thing we're doing, we're actually doing several things at once. At the very beginning when I took office, we know the system was 
fatally impacted, that we were not going to make any headway. So we triaged the cases that had legitimate concerns, potential discharge cases. We'll call it the bleeding victim. There was a righteous victim that was aggrieved. Those cases we focused on. The ones that were strictly policy violations with no victim attached, those ones we were able to uh, settle out and get them out of the system so we could focus on the case that we needed to push forward. At the same time, we're working hard improving the quality of the investigation. So if someone gets a discipline, most people are not going to be challenging it because a lot of the challenges from the past were because they were frivolous or bad investigations done very, very poorly, and the, uh, the level of discipline did not match the, the level of the offense. And now we're making a match, so it's, we're streamlining it, making it more effective. The majority of them tend to be sustained. And now that I've been in office for two and a half years, the quality is improving very greatly. So the number of people who are challenging it is starting to diminish, which is good, because that means it's gonna, the calendar is going to start clearing up. But this is something that's going to take time. It's not going to be resolved overnight, because they need to have a greater capacity at the Civil Service Commission, for example. They need more hearing officers so they can speed up that part of the process. And ultimately, the taxpayer is the one that is, uh, pays the price. Because, for example, a termination that the person gets reinstated, well, taxpayer has to eat the entire cost. Attorneys for both sides, the back pay, and to make the person whole again. And if it was done poorly, well, that's on the previous administration for doing that. after you, you respond. Mm -hmm. It's been going on like this since you've gotten into office. They come up with some new report, you counter it. Um, can you project on if this is ever going to come to a head, whether you're going to give, they're going to give, or is this going to be like this and escalate all the way up to the election? Well, I think it's going to keep on because that's they're setting their political uh, futures on that, that there's such a level of distrust. And here's the funny part. Or it's actually tragic. They will... They're telling the entire world through their actions not to trust the sheriff's department. And they'll turn around and say the public does not trust the sheriff's department when they play an integral role in trying to sell that idea. So if they would just power down and stop the presses and start working with the sheriff's department, we have bigger things to worry about. We have a homeless crisis that is spiraling out of control that is going to literally engulf L.A. County. We're on the receiving end of a very, very bad wave, and these people are still playing, you know, the old saying, narrow fiddles while Rome burns. That is exactly what they're doing. I'm going to stay focused on public safety. You're talking about the two that are engageable right now. Yes. Are they having any influence on the other three? Unfortunately, does not appear to be the case. These, uh, these three, the top three, they're, uh, they've sold their soul to the devil, so to speak. They're not going to change their way. Well, I will say this. There are several candidates that are active members of the department who are not being demoted because of the position that they occupy. They're not a confidential at-will employee. It's common sense. All right, so a claim of retaliation when you're my close advisor is insane. That'd be like a deputy mayor running against a mayor in re-election and still remain as a deputy mayor? Would you sustain that? Of course not. So trying to sustain that argument of retaliation does not hold water in any way, not legally in any way. In fact, there's, there's a boatload of case law exactly on that. So you may want to research that yourself. Right, yes, ma'am. We're going to end it. And uh, Spanish media, uh, the sheriff uh, will go ahead and do uh, a couple interviews uh, one-on-one. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.